Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I'm Leslie Umberger. I'm the curator of folk and self-taught art here at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Before we begin, please silence your cell phones and other electronic devices. I'm going to start by introducing our four panelists, and then each of them will make a short presentation. And after that, we'll open the floor to questions. This event is being recorded and webcast, so if you do have a question, please present it at one of the microphones located at the center of either aisle so that everybody can hear your questions very clearly. And we really appreciate having your feedback about the event or the museum experience in general, so please consider filling out a comment card at the end of the program. Tonight's discussion provides an opportunity to celebrate the renovation and reinstallation of the galleries dedicated to self-taught art here at the Smithsonian and explore the way in which this work is viewed and considered in contemporary settings spanning the museum, the academy, and the commercial market. Our panel focuses on the delicate balance of integrating work made without any regard for the art world into that very world, while still acknowledging its important points of departure. These specialists tonight bring a variety of perspectives and experiences, and I've asked each of them to discuss how we may foster public appreciation for work that might be perceived as simple or unsophisticated, but is much more often nuanced and complex, and how we might reconcile exceptional artistic autonomy with art historical importance and connoisseurship. Tom DeMaria has served as the director of Creative Growth Art Center since 2000. Creative Growth offers adults with developmental, mental, and physical disabilities a professional and peer-based studio environment for artistic practice as well as artistic representation. Tom is an award-winning award filmmaker who went to Creative Growth after serving as the assistant director for the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archi Archive at UC Berkeley. His background in the arts seeded his conviction that artists should work with artists, and his leadership transformed Creative Growth into an internationally recognized studio in which the foremost framework is art, not disability. Catherine Gentleson is the Mary and Dan Boone Curator of Folk and Self-Taught Art at the High Museum of Art in Atlanta. In 2014, Katie was the Douglas Foundation Predoctoral Fellow of American Art here at SAM. Her Duke University dissertation focused on the first self-taught American artists to rise to prominence in the post-war era, John Cain, Horace Pippin, and Grandma Moses. She examined the ways in which the art world both welcomed and marginalized these artists, and how both their presence and popular reception ultimately altered the course of American art. In her first year at the High, Katie has organized Green Pastures in memory of Thornton Dial Sr., a cut above wood sculpture from the Gordon W. Bailey collection, and Forging Connections, Ronald Lockett's Alabama Contemporaries. Bernard L. Herman is the George B. Tyndall Distinguished Professor of Southern Studies and Chair in the Department of American Studies at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He's the curator of Fever Within, The Art of Ronald Lockett, which debuted at the American Folk Art Museum in New York and which opens soon at the High. Recent publications include the exhibition catalog, Fever Within, Thornton Dial, Thoughts on Paper, and Troublesome Things in the Borderlands of American Art. Bernie's academic background is in folklore and folk life, and his areas of expertise span art, foodways, and the archaeology of architecture. Philip March Jones is the director of Andrew Edlin Gallery in New York. Previously, he was the director of the New York branch of the Paris-based Christian Burst Art Brut, and prior to that, he was the director of the Atlanta-based Souls Grown Deep Foundation which is dedicated to the preservation, documentation, and exhibition of African-American vernacular art. In 2009, Philip founded Institute 193, a nonprofit contemporary art space and publisher based in Lexington, Kentucky, whose mission is to collaborate with artists, writers, and musicians to document the cultural production of the, Amer of the modern South. His work and writings have been published by Vanderbilt University, Dutch to Digital, and the Jargon Society. 
So welcome panelists, and Tom, we begin with you. Uh, thank you, Leslie. I'm really happy to be here representing Creative Growth. I used to live in Washington for a few years, so it's a nice homecoming. Um, the city has changed since 1988, especially 14th Street Ness, where I now, where I used to live. So there's a whole history of art that's as kind of complex and as long as the history of humankind. And artists, contemporary artists, often reference this history when they're making art. But there's a whole group of people who make work that don't, whose work doesn't reference um, art history. And, you know, what do we think about what they're making and how do we come to understand and appreciate the things that they're making? Um, well, of course, one of the first things we want to do is just look at an object and decide what we think about it. Like, what do we see? You may or may not know this work, you know, but why would somebody make it? I mean, it's a simple question, but a fundamentally important question. I have never made anything that looks like this. You know, maybe you have, but why is it done? Is it shamanistic? Does it have a spiritual meaning? What's our engagement with it? What does it mean to you visually? If it's interesting, then maybe there's a lot of questions to ask about it. Let's see what a, one of the great art critics of our time, in my opinion, says about it. This is Roberta Smith writing about the work we've just seen. Sort of at the end of this review, she's saying that countering the impression, these are sort of exploding three-dimensional um, three, uh, paintings, and countering the impression that something has been hidden is the strong uh, sense of something uh, turned inside out. And the I love this part, the inescapable impression of a mind and a personality at work creating instances of insistent aesthetic communication. And I think that's kind of what we're talking about often in a self-taught arena, or for all artists, this insistent aesthetic communication. So if you kind of have that in your mind and look at the work again, does that help? You see it in a different way? Does it really matter? And in self-taught, there's often this, in, this argument or this consideration of the artist's biography. How does the story lead the art? Well, I believe the art should lead the story, of course, that if this is compelling, then meeting the maker might be compelling, and we might learn more about the context and the situation under which it was made. The artist who made these works uh, worked at Creative Growth. Her name is Judith Scott. She's no longer alive. Her biography is compelling. If you're looking for a compelling biography in the field, hers is probably second to none. Born a twin, Down syndrome, deaf, grows up with her sister, the girls are separated at age six. She's institutionalized for 40 years without language, left alone essentially in an institution. Her sister has an epiphany, finds her in Ohio, brings her from the institution to creative growth, where she sort of languishes for two years before picking up objects and wrapping them in fiber and fabric, which started a 20-year obsessive sculpture-making career. And, you know, they reflect her concerns about not having personal property in an institution, how she bound things and made them her own, two people tied together, two figures tied together like the two twins reunited. So her context, of course, influenced the work. Wow, because when we see it in a different context, we see it, can this work cross over into contemporary? This is in the Art Brut Museum in Lausanne, which is an, not a contemporary space particularly, but um, this is a contemporary space. This is her work in Tokyo at the Ginza Galleries there. And um, it really takes a different um, way of perceiving. This is the current exhibition, Traveling of Her Work. It's a one-woman show from the Sackler Center for Feminist Art at the Brooklyn Museum. It's been traveling for a year. It's now in Toronto at the Oakville Galleries until the end of the year. Where did Judith make her work? She made it at Creative Growth Art Center. Up until 1972, there's probably about a 150-year history of people in the field looking at um, uh, patients in psychiatric hospitals making art, art brute artists post-World War II. Who are these people making things that didn't go to art school, essentially? But in 1972, then-Governor Ronald Reagan suddenly deinstitutionalizes a whole population of people in California with developmental disabilities to save money. So what are, what are they going to do? Well, of course, artists lead the culture. So artists in Oakland got together, put some paint on a table in the garage in their home, and invited the people from the institution in, believing in the power of art as a transformative act. This is when Creative Growth is already 10 years old, and it still looks like an institution. 
It was a, it was a radical act. People with disabilities were extremely marginalized, marginalized, and the idea that they could become artists was beyond the comprehension of most people. Bodybuilding in 1982, where they used to fix cars, that now looks like this. We now serve 162 artists in our studio making visual art um, every week. And we have the only three, our community is advanced. We have the only three artists um, with developmental disabilities purchased by the Museum of Modern Art in New York for the permanent collection. And we really try to advance our artists into the highest level of being seen as contemporary. Our philosophy is very particular in that we're artists run. I went to art school. We have 28 staff. Everybody went to art school. There's no other training. It's not therapeutic. By definition, although something therapeutic happens, by making the work. And we've been there 45 years, and some of our artists have come every day for 45 years. We've been there for 45 years, and some of our artists have come there every day for 45 years. And this is how the staff works with the artists, helping enable them access to materials or with some of the technical process. But the voice is their own, and that's a complicated thing. How do you allow a person to achieve and become who they are without directing? And of course, there's a million questions about how things unfold. And um, our gallery here is a portal in the same building to allow the public to come in and see the works and understand, break down barriers around disability. Who are our people? So when people say or ask, do you direct the artists at Creative Growth? You must, because some of them are really good. I can use an example of a new artist, Monica Valentine, who started in our program two or three years ago. Uh, Monica has prosthetic eyes and has no vision. And coming to Creative Growth, I probably would not have said, well, why don't we give her a box of pins and sharp objects and color beads in sequence and have her make optically charged sculptural objects by touch. But that's what Monica has decided to do. Now, she says she feels the color in her hands, that the color has different feelings, and she senses that and builds these patterns that way. I was giving a talk at the University of Oregon two weeks ago, and an art student said, oh, I didn't know that feeling color in your hands was a thing. And I thought, I don't think it is a thing. I think it's her thing, and I think it's a pretty great thing. So this is Monica's thing, and it's about allowing the artists to find their way and not making assumptions about what they can or cannot do and learning from them. And I think this looks, you know, quite contemporary. Another artist who leads the way is a creative growth artist named William Scott. Now, William's this great guy because he wants to change the world and make the world a better place. So this is his self-portrait as William Scott, tolerant, popular guy. And in case you're not convinced, you can read on his tie that he's popular. So the painting will change his reality. It's a powerful idea that you can paint a new history for yourself, a new reality. The, he wants the world to be peaceful so bad that he's formed a partnership with the new black Jesus. They're going to do it together. You know, nothing is going to get in this guy's way. And here, William becomes Billy the Kid. Young, successful, athletic, on the Lakers, no disability. The painting is a transformative tool. It's a very contemporary idea. Sometimes I ask the question, can a person with a developmental disability challenge me intellectually? The answer is yes. William, for example, had an accident as a boy that scarred his body from a burn. Tom, I want the scar to be gone. I can't help you, William. It's bad. So William paints the hospital the day before he went in so that he can move back in time and un erase the accident. And he's also a phenomenal painter. This is painted from memory. The brick count and window count is correct. But he's moving back to the new San Francisco, the new hospital, the removal of a personal history. Isn't that a fantastic idea? You can paint away your past. And a stunning image finished two weeks ago, kind of Madonna and child of William and his mother in the 70s, happy, glowing, new, renewed, no disability. She's not going to get old. They're going to be together forever. It's this touching, utopian vision. Contemporary, I think, and we're, last I'm going to talk about Dan Miller because Dan is in the collection here and we're extremely excited about that. 
Dan is a young man on, well, he's my age, so he's a young man. Dan is an old guy who was born on the autistic spectrum and nonverbal. So 55 or so years ago, there wasn't as much known about early intervention in how we present artists or how we deal with people with autism and how important early intervention is. His mother was a school teacher, so she, she had that idea. So she'd sit with the kid every night, spelling words, just thinking he's going to talk, he's going to talk. And he did talk, but 20 years later, when he picked up a, a pen and a paintbrush and made these drawings and images built upon words, one letter after the other, the words that were in his head for 20 years that he didn't have a path forward with until he had the paper in front of him. Here you see uh, the light bulb, which is a theme for him. They reference his life. He broke a light bulb when he was a boy. It scared him. So we see light bulb in one, two, three, four, in numbered patterns that, that build blue, one of his favorite colors. And Dan sat in his uncle's hardware store on the weekends. So he loves the things. He, he kind of compulsively reads the Granger catalog, if you know what that is. So he writes the, uh, you know, about the things in the hardware store. Electric, circuits, router, switches. And I think somehow maybe the metaphorical for Dan's issues around communication. Can I get the circuits right? How can I get this language out? And he paints, and his work evolves. Here you see an object, the page, and you see the word written book in paper. And as his work has grown, and his colors have changed, and it, they've gotten larger and more complex, I think he puts to rest the argument that some people make around artists with disabilities that, or some self-taught artists, that they're kind of one-trick ponies. They do one thing again and again, but they don't really evolve because there's not an artist statement or a progression and Dan does progress, and these paintings are quite large now. And like most evolving artists, his work has become increasingly abstract. And then recently, he found an old typewriter at Creative Growth and sat down and typed the same words that he's been writing, making, you know, in a modern, concrete, fluxus poetry kind of style that he doesn't understand the reference to. So how do we understand artists whose work doesn't reflect art history, but whose work is making art history by seeing them as contemporary? And this is um, how Dan works. And we look at his helping us pick his work for a solo show in Paris, for example, and presenting his work at Rico Maresca in a really contemporary way, because that's how we want his work to be seen. The path to art is often the path to communication. And when you are in these magnificent new galleries here, you'll see this path to communication. The work is speaking to you. In many cases, the work is yelling at you. And if you open your ears, you'll see what the artist wants you to see. Hello. So the last time um, that I was here, or was supposed to be here, I went into labor. Um, so it's very nice to be back under different circumstances and wonderful to be here to celebrate um, the awesome reinstallation that, that Leslie has done with, with incredible self-taught work in this collection. So I'm going to do something a little bit different than what Tom has done and give you a kind of walk through time, a sense of how self-taught artists have been incorporated into uh, museum programs really over the course of the past century, um, and then kind of bring you up to date with where we are now. And I'm also going to start with somebody that he mentioned, Roberta Smith, this awesome New York Times art critic who's a great advocate for self-taught artists. So several years ago, New York Times art critic Roberta Smith called on all curators to figure out how to integrate the outsider geniuses or near geniuses into their programs. She criticized several major museums for keeping folk and academic art segregated in their recently rehung galleries of American art, which she felt remained monotonous and uninspired as a result. The snow globe needs to be shaken, she wrote. Homogeneity dulls the eye and lulls the brain. It is the discrepancies that grab our attention and make us look more sharply and deeply. As if heeding Smith's call, some of the nation's leading institutions have made notable room for self-taught artists in recent years. 
In fall of 2014, the Metropolitan Museum of Art announced its acquisition of 57 works of Southern vernacular art from the Souls Grown Deep Foundation, which will soon go on view uh, in the Breuer Building. And the same year, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art celebrated its 50th anniversary with an exhibition of 50 recent gifts from Gordon W. Bailey that included five works by Sam Doyle, Joseph S. Farmer, Clementine Hunter, and Herbert Singleton, the museum's first major acquisition of contemporary self-taught art. One of the most buzzed about incursions of self-taught artists into the mainstream in recent years was the appearance at the 2013 biennial uh, of the Italian-American self-taught artist Marino Ariti's Encyclopedic Palace, an epic architectural model that the artist designed in the post-war period as an addition to the National Mall. Biennale curator and new museum director Massimiliano Gioni encountered the work at the American Folk Art Museum and was so inspired by Ariti's dream of universal, all-embracing knowledge that the palace became the centerpiece of the Arsenale, which included the work of many self-taught artists as well. And of course, the market is responding, with commercial galleries specialized in emerging and established contemporary artists, such as James Fuentes, James Fuentes and Marianne Bosky, bringing self-taught artists such as Lonnie Hawley and Thornton Dial Sr. into their rosters. The Outsider Art Fair expanded to Paris, and Christie's recently revived its sales dedicated to outsider art, establishing new record prices for artists such as William Edmondson, whose boxer brought nearly $800,000 last January. All of this activity contributes to the impression that we're living in the midst of unprecedented boundary breaking, or in catchy newspaper headline speak, a moment when outsiders are becoming insiders. The reality, however, is that the American art world's love affair with self-taught artists began nearly a century ago, during a period when nationalism and populism governed the cultural zeitgeist in a manner not seen before or since. The first living self-taught artist to, gra to crash the gates of the mainstream art world was John Kane, a Scottish-American house painter who, seen from the Scottish Highlands, was exhibited in the 1927 edition of the Carnegie International, causing a frenzy in the press on par with the fascination generated by Gioni's inclusion of self-taught artists in Venice. Kane's work attracted support from many arbiters of modernism, including Alfred Barr and Albert Barnes, leading to an embrace of self-taught artists that flourished in the 1930s. In 1937, for instance, visionary Nashville sculptor William Edmondson became the first African-American artist to have a solo exhibition at MoMA, and the painting of Horace Pippin, who turned to art making as a way to rehabilitate an injury that he endured during, uh, while he was fighting in World War I, made its debut at a local art annual in Westchester, Pennsylvania. The following year, Pippin's uh, paintings were included in MoMA's sem seminal survey of self-taught artists, Masters of Popular Painting and Edmondson's sculpture was sent to Paris in the first major exhibition of American art to appear abroad in decades, also organized by MoMA. MoMA moved away from self-taught artists after a poorly received show of Morris Hirschfeld's work in 1943, but the 1940s witnessed the rise of Grandma Moses, hands down the most mainstreamed self-taught artist of all time. In addition to becoming a household name through her unforgettable mass media appearances and the licensing of her imagery for greeting cards, uh, fabrics and other consumables, Moses became a representative of American values abroad as her work toward Europe in the 1950s, a lesser known weapon in the cultural arsenal that the United States government drew upon during the Cold War. The following decade saw the founding of the, of the Museum of Early American Folk Art, later renamed the American Folk Art Museum and the first exhibition to explore a self-taught artist's environment, a show dedicated to Simon Rodia, the creator of the Watts Towers in Los Angeles. The Smithsonian also increased its engagement with self-taught artists in the 1960s, inviting the Kentucky carver Edgar Tolson to the 1968 edition of the Festival of American Folklife, and taking on James Hampton's epic tinfoil covered altar, which looks better than ever in the galleries. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, it's really um, incredibly breathtaking. And so his work, Throne of the Third Heaven of the Nation's General Assembly, was discovered after the artist died in 1965. When Pieces of the Throne traveled in 1971, the Whitney was among the participating venues, reviving the support of self-taught artists that it had first demonstrated in the interwar period. Just as John Kane and Horace Pippin had appeared in Whitney annuals in the 1930s and 40s, Edgar Tolson appeared in the 1973 biennial 
and the museum even dedicated solo exhibitions to Joseph Yoakum, the darling of the Chicago Imagists, and Minnie Evans, a maker of exuberant drawings depicting a world before the biblical flood. At this time, the High Museum of Art, where I work, began collecting the work of self-taught artists, starting with the luminous landscapes and portraits of Mattie Lou O'Kelly. And in 1972, Roger Cardinal published a book that not only revived interests in Jean Dubuffet's Art Brut movement, but was also a watershed moment in that its title, Outsider Art, the Anglophone translation of Art Brut preferred by Cardinal's editor, put that unshakable way of describing self-taught artists into circulation. A decade later, the field was changed again when John Beardsley and Jane Livingston curated Black Folk Art in America, 1930 to 1980, which opened at the Corcoran in 1982 and traveled to six American cities thereafter. The exhibition launched the careers of living artists like woodcarver Ulysses Davis and revived interests in the work of deceased artists like Bill Trailer, whose drawings were acquired in bulk by both the High and the Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts in the same year. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, shows dedicated to self-taught artists proliferated, with artists like Howard Finster, Sister Gertrude Morgan, Thornton Dial, and Sam Doyle receiving major solo exhibitions. As the 20th century drew to a close, the first generation of path-breaking collectors of contemporary self-taught artists, individuals like Chuck and Jan Rosenack, Michael and Julie Hall, and Bert Hemphill, began allocating their collections. As a result, by the end of the 20th century, in addition to museums dedicated to folk art in Baltimore, Chicago, San Diego, Santa Fe, and New York, general museums like the High, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, and the Milwaukee Art Museum counted hundreds of works by self-taught artists in their collections. These decades of exhibitions and acquisitions have laid the foundation for the moment that we're living in now, in which the inclusion of self-taught artists is part of a much larger paradigm shift brought on by the posts postmodernism, poststructuralism, and postcolonialism primarily. Now that these shifts in thinking have allowed us to confront the artificial and biased nature of our cultural canons, allowing for revisions in many different directions, academicians and curators are finding that the question is less what, whether we should be including self-taught artists and more how we do it. One approach is mainstream integration. The incorporation of self-taught artists into more generalized exhibitions of American and contemporary art this inclusive approach is how self-taught artists first entered the museum world, thinking back to John Cain's 1927 appearance at the Carnegie International or William Edmondson's solo show at MoMA a decade later. But there are many recent examples to draw upon, a few of which I've listed here. The distinct approaches of these shows vary, but they all rest upon an assumption that the art is primary and the biography of the artist, including his or her access to training, is secondary or even irrelevant. One of the many positive outcomes of this inclusive approach is a vindication of democracy in the arts. The demonstration of a kind of equity and respect that has eluded many of these artists in their daily lives, but can at least be realized in the utopian space of the art gallery. Museums that have rich collections of self-taught art, like Sam and the High um, in Milwaukee, also have the opportunity to cultivate the integrity of this field. Advancing an understanding of the impact that self-taught artists have had for more than a century, of the ways that they have not only complemented but also challenged art world norms, generating the kinds of advances we associate with trained modernists, may on the surface seem isolating, but its long-term effect will be to give self-taught artists their rightful claim in mainstream histories of American and 20th century art. Leslie's installation and her collaboration with her colleagues here at SAM are proof that inclusion and integrity are not mutually exclusive approaches to self-taught artists. They can be practiced simultaneously. William Edmondson, for instance, appears twice in the museum, first in sculpture curator Karen Lemmy's exhibition on the direct carving movement and its many practitioners, trained and untrained, and again in the new, newly reinstalled folk and self-taught galleries where Edmondson's uh, crucifix is juxtaposed with another emotionally charged meditation on Christ's sacrifice by Joe Minter, who, like Edmondson, installed his sculpture in a tour de force outdoor installation on his property, and he's still working on it. It is easy to get bogged down in how self-taught artists are classified and what inevitably inadequate adjective we choose to describe them. And whenever I do, I think back to something that Elaine Locke wrote about African-American artists in the late 1930s at a time when the first surveys of black art were taking the country by storm. He said, art doesn't die of labels, but only of neglect, for nobody's art is nobody's business. It reminds me that the main objective moving forward is to do everything we can as curators to make this art and the histories it represents everybody's business. 
an effort that hinges upon a variety of approaches and not a single silver bullet. Thanks. First, I'd like to uh, thank Leslie uh, Umberger uh, for the invitation to be here, and then also to recognize uh, Bill Arnett, Laura Bickford, uh, and folks from the Souls Grown Deep Foundation who are uh, here uh, with us this evening, as well as all the good folks here at the Smithsonian American Art Museum who have brought us together this evening. I also want to be brief because the elegance of Leslie's installation awaits us. Reflecting on the art of Ronald Lockett, Lonnie Holly described his younger friend as a universal messenger. Holly explained he had ideas and thoughts about material. He had ideas and thoughts about the rain, the mountains, the forces of nature, and all these other things that affect the human way of living. Holly summoned forth a remembered, a remembered moment. One day we went walking and he was asking me, said, Lonnie, he said, I don't really know anything about art. I don't really know what they want from me or what they want me to do. I said, Ronald, I showed him a piece of tin on the ground and I showed him a piece of wire and I said, Take those two pieces of material right there and consider them. Tell me what they look like to you. And then what I did, I put a stick in between the tin and the screen wire, and Ronald, when he got through with it, he had saw something kept and put in captivity. Holly continued, addressing the beauty in things discarded, deteriorated, discovered, repurposed, linking Lockett's art to Thornton Dial's and his own. That's the whole thing if you see these works that Mr. Dial did, Ronald did, all the things that I've done, we're trying to reduce it down to the particle debris degree. We want them to see the particle, see that right there. Holly offers us a great deal to ponder in his commentaries and his art, for example, yielding to the ancestors while controlling the hands of time from 1992. The significant part of his challenge resides in how we position art with words and in that gesture create a space for its reception. In the areas of outsider, self-taught, vernacular, folk, etc., art, that space is invariably circumscribed by what we might think of as a connoisseurship of difference or an authority on the margins. The point is this, those labels and frameworks place significant bodies of artistic production in the orbit of a dominant art culture that articulates its authority through assignments of otherness without ever describing itself. That dominant art culture arguably requires no modifiers. It constitutes an art world untroubled by terms that speak to social, economic, educational, class, institutional, ethnic identities. How then might we position the art of Hampton, Martinez, Harvey, Holly, Dial, Lockett, Butler, and others represented in the Smithsonian American Art Museum collections. The answer resides, at least in part, in how we encounter the work of art and the knowledge that our encounters are intensely subjective, hugely varied, and yet somehow comprehended within systems of sense-making. Making sense is a good place to start. 
When I first encountered Thornton Dial's African Jungle picture of 1989, some years ago, I was overwhelmed by the intensity of the mixed media painting. Women's faces built up from the surface, heads wreathed with snakes, possibly coral, possibly copperhead, all suggestively venomous, vividly white teeth and grimace, agitated swirls of disembodied heads. This is the lyric instant, the moment where the work calls attention to itself as a made thing, not as an image, but as a powerfully affecting presence. Even as the visual power of African jungle picture overwhelms the imagination, our minds turn inevitably to the necessity of making sense of wonder, of domesticating the wildness in the work, of narrating meaning, this is the narrative drive fundamental to being human. We are creatures driven by a need for making sense, even if that sense is consigned to the realm of nonsense, or folk, or self-taught, or outsider. The tension between lyric instant and narrative purpose flows through Dial's art from the top of the line, Steel of 1992, to the beginning of life in the yellow jungle to 2005. Dial's art possesses an astonishing capacity to draw us into the density and intensity of its forms, materials, and what we might think of as its wildness, the space between lyric and narrative, the capacity to slip the moorings of narrative certainty and yet never escape the assignment of meaning. Dial sculptures and works on paper, for example, The Movie Star and the Tiger Need One Another of 1992, likewise colonize that space between affect and exegesis. If we look at the idea of affect as the universe of feeling, we quickly recognize that feeling is something that is communicated and understood between people in ways that contribute to communities of sensibility. Rendering those communities visible requires explanatory narratives, and this is precisely where the art of Dial, Holly, Lockett, and Joe Minter troubles us. Our institutional habits lead us to situate the work outside the mainstream and to invent consigning categories around constructions of folk self-taught, naive, outsider, grassroots, and more. But we need to remember that the art is non-mainstream because we make it so. And in our critical labor, we place the art in the service of a politics of cultural power, revealing far more about ourselves than about, for example, Joe Minter's The Dreamer of 2005. The complexity and subtlety of Minter's creation reminds us that asking what something means is not the same as asking how something means. The former establishes a kind of intellectual ownership. Meaning is a thing that can be possessed and grasped. The latter recognizes that meaning is process, a wellspring for conversation, negotiation, and fluidity. It is situation and experience. As I move toward the end of this brief meditation, I want to introduce two additional thoughts that speak to our charge of fostering an appreciation for these complex and highly personal works, environment and performance. The installation of Joe Minter's The Dreamer, pedestaled and curated in the Smithsonian galleries, is far from move, removed from its origins in an equally curated assemblage of works that surround his home in Alabama. Like Dial's African jungle picture, the impact is visceral. One object flows into another, addressing deep histories of the Middle Passage, the historic battles for civil rights, and the continuing struggle for racial justice and equity. They, these are sculptures that document Bloody Sunday in the 1960s and Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Visitors can navigate the installation on their own, or they can walk with Minter, who narrates the aggregated work in his role as Griot. In either encounter, the viewer engages the larger rhetorical relationships that flow between the individual pieces. The museum cannot replicate 
that experience. Neither can the gallery visitor know that environment as a particularly site-specific and embodied form of narrative. What we can grasp, however, is the way in which situation embeds and directs our narrative purpose. When I engage the art of Lonnie Holly, I am happily reminded of the intangible, performative character of the made thing. Holly speaks and sings to the things he crafts throughout the making process. He literally fills the object with words that he decants in his presentation of the pieces to viewers. His interpretive performances cohere around themes shared with Minter, Dial, Lockett, and other makers in the Birmingham Bessemer Circle and beyond. Central to Holly's work is a belief in the transient nature of the made thing and the enduring nature of narrative complexity in the lyric instant. This is the art, the struggle, the persistence of the universal messenger. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my brief talk will deal with the life and work of an artist named Melvin Way and is titled Scientific Meanderings in a Portable Universe. Melvin Way invented the Dell computer, founded educational institutions all over the northeastern United States, and wrote songs that were recorded and popularized by the Supremes. He currently owns the Empire State Building but uses the Guggenheim Museum as his personal bedroom. These enormously important intellectual and cultural accomplishments might explain the $6.2 million he made last year, but what would you expect from a man who graduated high school 14 times, 10 times in South Carolina, and four times in New York City, and who also happens to be post-mortal? Some of Melvin's stories don't quite add up, and private details about a patient's life can't be legally disclosed. So instead, we rely on the artist's shifting explanations of the past, separating reality from fiction to the best of our ability. Despite some conflicting stories and timeline gaps, a few things about the artist's past are clear. Melvin Way was born in Ruffin, South Carolina in 1954 and traveled back and forth between there where he was raised by his mother, Flossie Way, one of the best names ever created, and Brooklyn where he stayed with relatives. By all accounts, Way was a talented student who was particularly interested in science and music, eventually attending the RCA Technical School in Midtown Manhattan. In the early 1970s, he joined a music group with friends composing funk ballads and playing gigs in the city. He also experimented with drugs. To make ends meet, he worked odd jobs, including a stint as a machinist before developing schizophrenia in his, early 19, in his early 20s. His life became infinitely more complicated in ways shuffled in and out of state-run mental institutions, halfway houses, drug rehabilitation centers, homeless shelters, and the occasional correctional facility. Excuse me. In 1989, Way met Andrew Castrucci, an artist and educator on Wards Island at a workshop run by Ho Hospital Audiences Incorporated, or HAI. At the time, Melvin was living in the psychiatric ward of the Keener Men's Shelter. Some of the patients came from Rikers, others from the prison next door. There were major crack and AIDS epidemics and a recent outbreak of TB was crippling the shelter. The staff often had to bribe the men. If they didn't take their meds, they wouldn't get new sneakers. Some chose to abandon the shelter altogether and live in squatter encampments in the surrounding, wood, in the surrounding woods. The arts program included approximately 100 men, but Castrucci took special interest in Way's work. Castrucci describes meeting Melvin in his art classes. He was extremely paranoid about his drawings. I don't share them with anybody else. He did, however, share them with his teacher. In turn, this is an early drawing from 1989, which I was supposed to show you earlier. And... Um, in, in turn, Castrucci showed him da Vinci's notebooks, and Way responded by copying da Vinci's words and symbols backwards, insisting on his ability to decode their true nature in that way. He also shared with him books on 19th and 20th century European and American art. 
Wei was particularly drawn to the colors of the post-impressionists and the term fauvism began showing up in his equations. Castrucci continued to bring Wei navigational charts, maps, medieval diagrams, and other texts of potential interest. The words, symbols, and forms inevitably worked themselves into Wei's drawings. I'm going to show you these things are actually a little bit out of order here. Okay. This is the Da Vinci Codex. And these are the Fovis drawings. And if you see here, there is the word Fovism that appears in the drawing. Um, we never directly participated in the art classes offered at the shelter, but was present, showing up and often emptying his pockets filled with secret messages. He wore a large raincoat and carried dozens of drawings in its pockets. Castrucci says, you could tell some of these drawings had been through a couple of rainstorms, ink bleeding, but he kept adding more markings. I always felt that his works had to go through a sort of baptism before being released into the world. Speaking to Melvin was like talking to Walt Disney on LSD. He talked about Barry White, Isaac Hayes, the future of things to come, Russia buying back Alaska, the size of Texas, chemical reactions, polynomials, quadratics, and other variables. Melvin Milky Way was an outer space communicator in a jet set omniverse. Way has made perhaps a few thousand drawings over the course of his life, but many have been destroyed by the elements or worn thin by the constant shuffling back and forth among backpacks, wallets, pockets, drawers, and other hiding places. Visually, Way's drawings look like copied textbook chemical formulas, but do not ultimately describe any particular substance known to man. There are, however, moments of scientific clarity, including the oft repeated formula for the principle of uncertainty. In quantum mechanics, the uncertainty principle, also known as Heisenberg's principle, is any of a variety of mathematical inequalities asserting a fundamental limit to the precision with which certain pairs of physical properties of a particle such as X and P can be known. Introduced in 1927, it states that the more precisely the position of a particle is determined, the less precisely its momentum can be known and vice versa. In 1928, the formal inequality relating the standard deviation of X and P was derived by a man named Herman Way. No relation. Occasionally, implicit references to the artist's life and his struggles do show up in the works. I've chosen a few particular interests. Here you have Chocolate City, which is, I guess, where we happen to be this evening. The X-Men, one of his favorite comic book series, and the forever lucrative formula for cocaine. Most of Melvin's visual language is chemical notation, elemental signatures, growth patterns, life diagrams, anatomical renderings, and physics equations punctuated by a series of letters, dashes, dots, parentheses, and other random grammatical signs. In a recent article about Way, Jerry Saul writes, it doesn't matter to me if Way is copying these formulas or grabbing them from his involuting memory, or even if they're mad. I will never understand what he's saying any better than I understand what all the tens of thousands of unknown microbes on the edge of my cup are in relation to me, or what their life form may be. Melvin, in turn, explain, in turn explains his work. I'm not drawing now. I'm doing remedial science work, medical science, medical society. I work on them for three weeks each because it's all about nutrition. Way speaks like he draws. Connections are made and quickly passed over in favor of new connections. The artist's improvisational and scientific meanderings offer us the possibility of a parallel universe where the basic rules that govern our world are displaced, erased, redrawn, reconfigured, and covered in tape. Those new truths are stashed deep in the artist's pockets or hidden away somewhere for safekeeping. Way's drawings are frequently referred to as cryptograms, but by definition, cryptograms can be solved, whereas Way's drawings have no beginning, end, or decodable message. Instead, they speak to the infinite possibilities of both imagination and science, visually describing other realities and ways of seeing. The opposite of truth is not necessarily a lie or error, but forgetfulness. Indeed, in a newly released short film about the artist, Melvin Way says, I live in a state of amnesia. I've been living in a state of amnesia for 35 years. He further explains, I was the first person to walk on the moon, Jupiter, Mars, Pluto. I name those. Myself, since I am Mr. Universe. He occasionally signs his drawings as Melvin Milky Way Way. 
They are now entering, much like the artist himself, into major private and museum collections, including the Smithsonian American Art Museum and the American Folk Art Museum in New York. But regardless of any critical acclaim, Melvin Way still travels with his drawings, digging into his pockets for them as others would dig for a cell phone, eager to record the next reaction or spark with his pen on textured, sweaty, tape-covered transcriptions of his highly personal, highly portable universe. These drawings surely, if temporarily, free the artist from his position on earth and give him peace in a life generally ruled by uncertainty and chaos. Thank you. We're going to take just a minute to put some chairs out for our speakers and then we'll open up for questions. I think you can come on up, you guys. Those were all really interesting presentations from, as I said, really different perspectives. Um, these people know the artists they work with very well, so this is a fantastic opportunity to ask them very specific questions about these artists. Um, would anybody like to start us off? If not, I will start. Okay, I will start. Oh, yes, ma'am, go ahead. Hi. I don't have a question about one of the specific artists, but I do have a question that um, some of your wonderful presentations brought to mind. I was thinking a lot about the concept of um, the market in relation to outsider art, which um, Catherine Jonelson touched on. Um, and it made me think about how um, a lot of the contemporary art that's being um, made now is taking place in the digital sphere, and I think that that's true of a lot of contemporary self-taught and outsider art. And the interesting thing about that to me is that it bypasses the market or has the potential to bypass the market it is in some ways uncommodifiable. And so I'm wondering if any of you, any of you all are doing any work around, um, in particular, memes as outsider or self-taught art, or if you have any thoughts about that possibility. about the possibility of um, digital work being done by? Specifically memes. Like if anyone, if any of you all are, are looking at or have any thought about the possibility of memes as self-taught or outsider art. It's a hyper contemporary question and it's okay if the answer is pass. I can return to my seat. <laughs> any of you have any thoughts on that? Well, um, I guess as the uh, lone commercial gallery director, um, I could attempt to, but I, I don't really think that memes particularly enter into uh, into our particular field of uh, of study. I mean, the the very few digital works that exist within this this so-called field, I think, will be limited to some things that people like Lonnie Holly have done and and others I can I can think of, but they're few and far between, and they're not really the kind of sarcastic socio social media-driven things that I think that, that you're talking about? I don't, I don't 
know fully what you mean by digital work, but we have a digital program both in terms of uh, film and video animation, digital drawings, other sorts of work that our artists are doing. And we have found that particularly young adults on the autistic spectrum respond better to screens and digital imagery than they do to traditional materials. So that's an area that we're actually increasing um, uh, uh, engagement with our artists in. And it brings up just regular contemporary questions about how it presents and if it sells or not. And we're doing some um, digital outprinting of some graphic uh, digitally constructed drawings in the way that um, I think contemporary galleries are struggling or not with presentation and pricing. Yes, ma'am. Do you want to go to the microphone? I really don't know how to word this. Uh, I've been teaching art to children for several decades, and I work with very fine children that have some processing issues. And we were doing designs last spring, and this one student drew in pencil something very simple. It was symmetrical and had some freeform lines. But I walked by his seat, and all of a sudden, I couldn't move, and I felt a whole moment of just pause and felt this circle here. And out of my 25 years of teaching, I've never had this. And so the fact that you all are so progressive, how do we nurture this for certain children you know, where the parents might have hope that the kid might go to college and this and that, but the kid's very bright, but he has some severe, I don't know if it was severe, but some learning problems. So as a teacher, I didn't know what to do. I called the mother, but I don't think she really got it. In my experience, the parents don't get it. And um, in my experience, the um, parents don't get it. And as someone who went to art school, no one's parents were happy they went to art school. And, <laughs> Without exception, it's the same with creative growth. You know, our art is common, they earn money, we send the checks home, and parents bring it back, there must be a mistake, you know, get paid to be an artist. So, um, you know, it's really about a cultural shift in value and aesthetics and art in a way that's important. So it's not just necessarily within the self-taught, it's within the field that's really important. But that moment of swooning or seeing the connectivity and the creativity in that moment is such a great visceral human experience why we don't value it more as society, I don't know. So we just really have to try to work within institutions of artists and, um, and, um, and different kinds of um, situations to really uh, value our artists and their work. Um, two questions that are related. Katie Jenelson mentioned uh, self-taught artists from the 20s and 30s and 40s, which were very popular at the time, but many of them are not known now. Why is that? And then do you think the same thing will happen with the Thornton Dowles, the contemporary, the, the well-known artists from this time period? And if so, or if not, why? Um, so. Carl's question, oh, thank you. Is this working? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so it's interesting because I think that part of what happens, um, you know, after basically in this war period, um, strong program, 
is that we, we also get in that same moment a lot of specialized institutions that come into being. So I mentioned that in my talk. The Museum of Early American Folk Art is founded in the early 60s. Um, you have uh, the collection of another really important self-taught art collector who had been on the board of MoMA give his collection to the Fenmore Art Museum of Cooperstown. So the legacy of these artists um, gets primarily stewarded by these specialized institutions, which is great because, you know, thanks to them, we have decades of exhibitions and preservation efforts that have made it possible um, for the general interest museums to come in and, and kind of pick up the torch. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think part of what happened in the post-war period is that you get the specialization of the field. And so artists like John Kane or Horace Pippin, who were once a part of contemporary art, um, get kind of sidelined into this self-taught category. I don't think it's going to happen in the same way with what we're experiencing now with our recognition of incredible artists like Thornton Dial because, I mean, he's already having an impact in so many museums all across the country. Um, and so it's, 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 that we're just too conscious of it now, of the fact that these artists, as much as it's important that we continue to have these specialized institutions that are dedicated to stewarding their legacies, um, they're everywhere. And, and, and you know, I think a thread that kind of ran between everyone's talks is that we're living in a moment where these artists are being embraced, not just as self-taught, not just as outsider or whatever you want to call them, but as great contemporary artists, as great 20th century artists. So I don't see the same thing happening that happened earlier in the century, um, you know, in, in our near future. Well, actually, is that you know you, I can think of more recent examples of folks who've um, lost currency. Lee Gotti, Eddie Arning, um, both you know had their these extraordinary moments, um, and then really have faded from a lot of the conversation. The question is, you know, about um, Mr. Dial or Lonnie Holly or Joe Minter. I think is a very different kind of question in part is the way in which we position um, artists in these categories, uh, often in terms of isolates or uh, solitary creators. And what we're really seeing um, in light of the work of uh, Dial and others is really something along the lines of a school or a circle, uh, which is every bit as dynamic, say, as the abstract expressionists were in their day. Are all the abstract expressionists uh, held in equal esteem? No. Um, but is the movement one that is transcendent and of uh, continuing vitality and importance? Absolutely. And I feel very strongly that that is uh, exactly the, the kind of conversation we're in now. I also just had one more thought, which is um, part of why the moment we're living in now is different, is that you know, the way that we define American art and our cultural canons, which is something I was kind of alluding to in our talk, has changed so tremendously since the 1980s. I mean, you, know, you look around this institution and the definition of American art that you see in its galleries, not just the folk and self-taught galleries, but throughout the entire institution, is amazing. You know, you really see representation of African American artists, you see representation of Native American artists, you see representation of women artists, and you wouldn't have seen that in the 20s and 30s in the moment that the self-taught artists were first being embraced. So it, they were in a way ahead of their time when they, when they came into the contemporary art picture in the 20s and 30s, and institutions really had to catch up with that um, and start to broaden their perceptions of, you know, who can be an artist. And that's, that's the moment that we're living in today, and we're not going to go back from that. Carl, did you have a second question, or was oh, that was it? Okay. Everyone. Okay. All right. Um, Philip, I have a question for you um, about Melvin Way. You know, his art is, it's unconventional in so many ways, but it's incredibly visually compelling and complex but it doesn't really offer many footholds for its audience. Um, how do you think it's possible to develop an appreciation for his work, but also how do you um, evaluate it and create standards for understanding like what it's about, how to talk about it, and how to make people appreciate it? Well, that's more than a question. Um, <laughs> that's like seven. Um, but. Um, and, and that's sort of my job, I think, and, and, and a lot of that's sort of your job, too. Um, you know, the role of, the, the role of gallerist is, uh, is maybe not as specific um, 
as I would like it to be. I mean, you end up being an advocate and you end up doing all these other kind of things, but uh, once you get the works into the institutions and once they, once they kind of arrive here, then it's that whole business of kind of assigning them into different categories and places and, and educational programming around it and all those kinds of things. My experience with Melvin's work um, was actually uh, very personal. And, and I'm not sure how you, um, how you do that. I mean, my, uh, my talk was obviously uh, showering and bathing everybody in context, which uh, you know, some people would probably not like and, and others would love, because there is always that debate about how much of the bio and what to lead with and what's really important and can these objects live on their own, which of course they can, but neither can you, uh, neither can you divorce these, these objects from, from the way in which they were made. And by the you know, and by whom? Uh, somebody sitting in a room, and in a lot of essays, actually, uh, ways work. People have tried to compare it to John Cage and, and other people who were doing kind of visual, uh, visual notation and things. And, and it just doesn't really, for me, make a lot of sense. And um, and you're really trying to make it into something it's not or relate it to something, uh, sort of a la parallel visions. Um, but. Um, you know, it, it's all kind of there in ways work. There are those personal touches and there are things about pop culture and about his personal life that, that are readily available, but, but, but it's also not an easy work to, to, immediately, to immediately grasp. But if you don't feel it and you don't see it and you don't read it, um, I don't know, isn't that kind of the problem of art, right? It's like, how, I don't know. It's very tough. That kind of leads me into a question that I have for Tom. Um, in a 2015 New York Times article by Nathaniel Rich, he noted that the curator and museum director, Lawrence Rinder, um, flatly rejects the direct connection between unusual biographies and um, inherently fascinating art, which I understand as an argument that the artists make valid work, um, that we're not simply interested in some element of difference only. And I think that you agree with him on these specific points. And you, you also argue that a culture of disability informs the work. Can you explain the nuances of that? Yeah, I'm very interested in the culture of disability and how it informs the work because I think that there is, and um, I just see anecdotally, almost like a clinician, the artists with certain kinds of disabilities having certain kind of aesthetic um, qualities in their work that I think um, are sort of, it's interesting to look at if we look at some of the serial repetition of people on the autistic spectrum, some of the tactile bundling, touching um, kinds of components to people with Down syndrome, the similarities that I see uh, that cross through um, programs um, that we've worked with in Japan and in Australia and in America and in, and in Ireland and in um, Morocco, and you see people with similar kinds of disabilities working in similarly aesthetically interesting ways. I think there's a thread there that is um, really a compelling one. And I think um, it's, it, it's its own culture. And I think we accept that certain cultural traditions bring an aesthetic forward. And I'm just interested in how this kind of, if it is a cultural distinction with people with disabilities, how the thread runs through of them universally as opposed to within a cluster of a community or a particular place. And, uh, you know, there is, I've been working with some researchers at uh, University of California, San Francisco about how the brain works. And they're looking at what part of the brain is actually triggers creativity. And in some people with developmental disabilities, there are some um, parts of the brain that are stronger and less. And I think that there might be, the research on this field is still very new, but it might be that there are certain um, just like with Monica Valentine, who can feel the color in her hands because she can't see that there are certain parts of the creative brain that come forward or are more pronounced and with certain kinds of disability. Very interesting. Thank you. Yes. I'm, I'm just curious to hear from the panel on how they define a folk artist or a self-taught artist. And if the definition is something along the lines of somebody who lacks formal training and is disconnected from the art world, is it possible that a person that's a folk artist can then transcend that and cease becoming a folk artist once they get training or get connected with the art world? I'm just interested how useful this label is and why a folk artist isn't just an artist. 
Katie, you want to tackle that? Sure. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think that you kind of mentioned what the basic common denominator among self-taught self or folk artists is, which is that they didn't go to art school. Um, but I do think that many of them transcend the notion that they're separated from art history in some way all throughout their careers. I mean, there's so many ways you can access art history not in art school. And there are, you know, go to the library, you can see reproductions done in postcards, et cetera, et cetera. And there are tons of examples in the galleries right now. Leslie has work by Eddie Muma, who um, painted his work based on uh, Rembrandt and other kind of golden age of, you know, Dutch Republic painters of their depictions of burgers and this kind of thing. Um, and so there's really plenty of examples of how self-taught artists do transcend that sense that they're, they've been isolated in some way. I mean, it's, I don't think that it is important that we continue to call them self-taught artists exclusively. Um, I think that you know, embracing them again as American or contemporary artists is really where we're going. Um, but the fact that they, are, that they didn't go to art school, that they developed their kind of creative process in some way outside of a you know, trained studio practice will come out at some point when you're exhibiting their work. And it kind of goes to what Philip was saying just a second ago that um, you know, you can try to present the whole art object and the whole body of work without making any reference to biography. But we enjoy the biographies of all artists, you know, trained or untrained. We like knowing who, where they went to school, where they're from, what kinds of issues interested them, all that sort of thing. Um, and so eventually it does come out. And, and, and with self-taught artists, you know, I don't think that we're ever going to really try to redact the fact that they have this really idiosyncratic way um, of, of, of developing their ideas that didn't happen in art school. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna disagree slightly here, is that the problem with um, framing it this way is this idea of school, uh, which is essentially that of a formal learning institution. And the work that I've done with uh, a number of artists would lead me to um, uh, the conclusion, in fact, there are all sorts of schools uh, that might not look like our understandings, our individual understandings of what constitutes a school. The, quilts of, the quilt makers of G's Bend have one of the most extraordinarily sophisticated uh, curricula in uh, composition uh, and making. Uh, I think of the way in which uh, folks in the Birmingham Bessemer Circle uh, really exist in a long stream, uh, a long continuum of creative practices that are learned, um, that are not autochthonous uh, in the sense of springing fully formed uh, uh, from the earth. Um, so I think that part of this is around this question of what constitutes institutions. Uh, and we are in a moment where we are positioned to question the nature of what those uh, institutions are and to offer uh, perhaps more generous, uh, expansive, and inclusive frameworks. Yeah, I would add, though, that, I mean, part of the reason, like, wh why I wanted to go kind of back in time and show you the way that self-taught artists have been um, an important part of the cultural landscape for so many years is, is to help us understand that, I mean, it's, so there are self-taught artists all over the world and all throughout time, um, obviously. But in America, they've had this special resonance because of the way um, that the, self, the notion of being self-taught really resonates with our cultural values of being like self-made you know, Americans. And the notion that we're, um, you know, in the 1930s when, when they were really being embraced, this was a time when the American art world was searching still for a great American art and looking for authenticity in art and looking for what made American art American and not just derivative of European, you know, generations of European art. Um, and so self-taught artists became embraced in that period because they seem to represent this important, you know, completely indigenous way of making art, which of course, there's folk art in every country. Um, but this was the way that it was being framed and the way that it became, you know, seen as important in that moment. And so the notion of being self-taught is something that I don't think is only something that we shouldn't just see as being a negative, as though it makes you, you know, not a real artist, but it's something that has been culturally important in this country for so many years. Okay, next question. Uh, yes, <clears throat> I'm a self-taught artist and my works are in uh, several of the museums. And um, 
My, my, I've had, I've had, I've got a, a sensitive question here. I grew up in the South, and I grew up in a biracial family. And uh, for example, in my in my family, <clears throat> I, I have a sister that's African American, identifies as African American, and yet um, I'm in the uh, American Folk Art Museum. I'm in the Art Brut Museum in Switzerland. And yet, I've never been really, um, uh, you know, um, uh, recognized by the High Museum. And I've always felt uncomfortable about that. Um, she just took her job. She threw down the gauntlet. Yeah, I've only been there for a year, sir. Give so. her a chance. Okay, I, I know, but I mean, I just, I mean, I, I, you know, I grew up in rural, in the rural South and also in the inner city. And I know the, the, the American, you know, I know the American black experience. I've lived it in my family. I'm, I'm now I'm a crossover artist and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm white and I'm, I'm educated and I've traveled all over the world, but I've always felt uncomfortable about that, some of that uh, dialogue and stuff. I mean, where do I fit in, in, in that? You know, I grew up in poverty and I lived on the streets and I was an outsider artist from 1986 to 1992, and I'm no longer an outsider artist. I'm somebody who's gone on and been fortunate. I'm a calendar savant. I've been able to, to have a life and stuff, but you know, it just feels uncomfortable for me sometimes, some of that, that, uh, uh, that you know, my sister makes art. Uh, she's an outsider and she'll never really be recognized, I suppose, because she doesn't care about that and stuff. But, uh, you know, I just feel like the, the high art sh museum should broaden, broaden that conversation some or something. I don't know. That's my opinion. Thank you. I look forward to learning more about your art. <laughs> Next comment or question? Hi. Uh, I'm, I'm a former stu student of Bernie, so say hi, Susan, back here. <laughs> um, and uh, would uh, point out that it's partly due to him. I think it was probably 30 years ago that I sat in in one of the first classes Bernie offered on folk art um, when I was a graduate student. And uh, one of the things that has that struck me then and has struck me ever since, and it hasn't come up yet today, which is why I'm up here, is the use of materials. Um, and specifically, I think, especially in some of the environments, but in a lot of the art that we saw going by today, um, we're seeing a sort of repurposing of everyday materials that may be a slight difference from artists that come through a more formal training and are brought up in the tradition of using specific art materials. So I wonder if that's another um, uh, convergence within uh, outsider art. And I also just had a thought if the, the 20th century uh, has something to do with it in the sense of a sort of post-consumer society where we're at the point where we have all this stuff lying around that can be so easily repurposed. So I just wondered if anyone had any comments on that. We certainly deal with artists that create a growth that are repurposing and the Judith Scott, for an example, um, you know, really collected, we say that she appropriated objects, which means she stole them from everywhere and just bundled them into sculptures. And uh, it poses a question around conservatorship as well. I was talking to Leslie about a large Dan Miller piece and how, you know, our artists aren't pristine and it's often things collected um, and bundled from other sources. And I think with what I've seen from the um, creative growth artists is that there's an interest in in some of the artists and things that are discarded, things that are repurposed, things that are second generation, things that are remade, because in many ways those are metaphors for what they're doing and what their lives have been, and they see things, and they don't, and they don't they have a quest for just like pristine materials because they don't necessarily have that tradition or, or those values that everything has to be clean and perfect. Every, uh, you know, a, a, a lunch bucket and a piece of cardboard and a piece of rubber hose is interesting as something that you'd get from an art store. And I think it's just that the whole range of how an artist appro approaches objects is um, in a self-taught field, or particularly with an artist with disabilities perhaps, is just, um, you know, everything gets turned upside down. There is no right. Yes. 
My question <clears throat> is about how you title or label this kind of art. Uh, folk art, well, it isn't really folk in the usual sense of the word. I mean, we now have prisoners, we have mental patients creating this sort of art. Then outsider art, well, outside of what? Yes, art schools for sure, but museums? No, not museums anymore. Uh, and again, there's contact with, you know, art reproductions and art sources. To me, some of the worst is self-taught art. I mean, an artist doesn't teach himself or herself. To me, that is maybe the worst title. But I wondered if you had any thoughts about this, how you describe this art, how you title it, et cetera. Well, I have a very straightforward answer to that. It's all art to me. Um, and uh, I'm not being flip about this, is that you have to ask yourself is what is the uh, cultural and political work that the terms do? Um, you know, and typically what they tend to do is, uh, as I mentioned in my remarks, is uh, offer a kind of platform for a connoisseurship of difference, uh, of otherness. And then you have to ask yourself, why do you need to do that? Uh, and it has a lot to do about uh, with the location of power um, not just in art worlds, but in the, uh, the larger worlds that we inhabit. So that um, trying to bound these uh, works uh, with those kinds of socially conditioned um, uh, labels uh, is uh, hugely problematic. And it never describes it art. It only describes the people that use the labels. Yeah, and that dovetails a little bit with what um, the artist George Widener brought up a few minutes ago, which is that sometimes the specifics are very nuanced and difficult and that they don't fit into an easy definition that you could be presented in a variety of galleries and a variety of contexts depending on how the work was going to be spoken about and that it gives it a lot of flexibility, but it also challenges the way museums and viewers think about it, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that that's exciting, and that's um, you know what we're here to talk about. And um, I thank you for bringing it up. Yes. Well, the thinking was that we like to both um, break out the galleries in very specified ways so that people can think differently about, um, think in depth about what that kind of material might be and how broad it might be, that it isn't this neat and tidy category, but that it's actually quite complex and difficult. Um, that means that almost any of it could be appropriate in a different place in the museum. And in fact, there is a lot of work by self-taught artists throughout the museum. Um, we have Grandma Moses in the um, Experience America galleries. As Katie pointed out, William Edmondson in direct carving. And George as a living artist who is extremely interesting and uh, really working with things that challenge people conceptually and are visually stimulating. We thought that that would be a wonderful place to put his work and sort of, you know, probe those questions about who goes where and why and um, put it in a place where it was also stimulated by some of the work surrounding it, which had to do with um, also like his particular piece with text and numbers and um, sort of a more conceptual context for it. So I think that concludes our program. We are greatly, um, thrilled that everybody came tonight and I'm really appreciative so thank you so much for coming and enjoy the rest of your evening.